All right. Well, I am just waiting for one more of our amazing speakers to hop on uh, and then we'll get going. Um, but feel free to um, maybe share in the chat, uh, you know, just in lieu of introductions, uh, your name and association where, and where your coming to us from. And we'll get going in just a minute. Who's going to be the first? Okay, I'm Susan. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, let's 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 great. do it. Let's do it in the chat, just because it could take it could take a good long while for us to um, <laughs> do it verbally. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get going, and fingers crossed that our our first speaker joins. If not, maybe we'll mix it up a little bit. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Adrian Wren. I'm a project leader with Valley Vision. I, I might be in an echoey room, so just let me know if, if I need to enunciate a little bit better. I'm currently in Billings, Montana, um, taking advantage of a uh, job transition with my partner, and we're doing a cross-country road trip. So um, that's where I am. I'm at a coffee shop in Billings. So apologies for any technical or sound-related issues with that. Um, so again, welcome. Um, this, of course, is the second virtual quarterly luncheon of 2021 uh, that the Cleaner Air Partnership uh, regularly hosts. We're, we're always pleased to see so much interest in the health impacts of wildfire smoke uh, and also what's being done about it from both a rural and an urban perspective. So as we emerge you know, from a global pandemic with many links to air quality issues, um, we at the Cleaner Air Partnership really appreciate the continued support and interest in important topics like this. So again, uh, for those of you who are just joining, please introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, and while you're doing that, uh, for those of you who are new to CAP events, I can provide a little bit of background. So uh, this is a little before my time, but the Cleaner Air Partnership was created actually in 1986 by the Sacramento Metro Chamber of Commerce in Breathe, California, Sacramento region. Um, Valley Vision began to manage it about 15 years ago. Uh, and it's a current, currently a broad-based partnership, including business leaders, environmental advocates, public health nonprofits, and our region's five air quality management districts who are um, all working together to help the six county Sacramento region, plus, as Matt Earhart can tell you, a little slice of Solano County um, protect public health and promote economic growth by advocating for cleaner air. Um, so uh, a big thank you to our event sponsors, the Sac Metro Air District, Tykert, SMUD, Sutter Health, Union Pacific, the Sacramento Association of Realtors, the Placer County Air Pollution Control District, Yolo Solano Air Quality Management District, the El Dorado County Air Quality Management District, and the Healthy Air Alliance. And of course, want to welcome our two newest um, executive committee members and contributors, the North State Building Industry Association and PG&E. So welcome to the Cleaner Air Partnership. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we dive in. This meeting is, of course, being recorded and a link will be shared with you all early next week. You can always find recordings of Valley Vision hosted events, including Cleaner Air Partnership meetings on our YouTube page. Um, and of course, as you've, you've likely noticed, this is a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom webinar. Um, so it's more interactive. We'll have regular breakpoints uh, between our speakers so you can uh, you know, ask and ask questions and have your questions answered please do use the raise hand function. It's just easier to track um, who, who has questions that way. Depending on your version of Zoom, it's either under the participants button or the reactions button uh, on your interface. Uh, those using the Zoom app on your iPhone or Android should also have that option. And then those of you calling in can do dial star nine and that'll raise your hand and we'll see that. Of course, there's a chat box for comments and conversation to take place. Uh, and again, the Q&A will happen um, between presentations. So uh, I'd like to introduce Caitlin Blockus next. She is a Valley Vision Project Associate supporting our MEDI um, workforce development portfolio. So welcome, Kate, Caitlin. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Adrian. I'm Caitlin Blockus. I'm originally from Placerville up in El Dorado County. So excited to hear one of our guest speakers who's uh, talking about that area today. But I joined Valley Vision back in March and it's been a great introduction so far and actually interested in seeing the structure of this meeting for some of our other work. So great to meet you all here today. And I will be running slideshow in the background as Adrian's little tech helper here. So um, whatever y'all need, I'm here for you. Yeah, thank you so much, Caitlin. 
And before we dive into the, the real meat of the, the meeting, um, I would like to just launch a quick, fun Zoom poll. Um, so you should see it on your screen now. What is your current favorite genre of TV show? This is just kind of a, a bit of an icebreaker. I think with COVID, we've all maybe been at home a little bit more than usual uh, and maybe been watching some television. So uh, I'm gonna leave it open for about 10 more seconds and then I will share the results. What's your current favorite genre? All right, five, four, three, two, one. Let's share the results. All right, looks like comedy wins out, followed by sci-fi fantasy, followed by reality, or followed by other than reality TV, or than drama, reality TV, and true crime. Um, all right, folks, well, that's, that's just some good, some good fun data to start our day, I suppose. With that, um, let's dive into the subject matter. So to give you just a roadmap of today's events, there are three parts to it. And I just wanna make sure that Pat, Pat Dwyer is on the line. Pat, are you with us? You're our first speaker. Uh, and if not, we can maybe have the other Pat, Patrick Giles, go, go first. But, but um, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do the continue on with sort of the roadmap for today. Um, Pat Dwyer is chair of the Logtown Fire Safe Council. Um, he's, he will talk about efforts at wildfire and smoke mitigation in rural El Dorado County. Um, after him, or potentially before him, we'll also hear from Pat Giles, Chief Operating Officer at Breathe California Sacramento Region, who will talk to us about the urban emergency smoke planning efforts that are underway as a result of AB 661. And then last but not least, we'll learn about the human scale health impacts of wildfire smoke from Vanessa Walker. She is a doctor of osteopathic medicine, also known as a DO, uh, and she's medical director of Sutter Health's Valley Area EICU. So thank you all. Uh, and again, I'm doing one more shout out to see if Pat Dwyer is with us. And if not, I am going to ask Patrick Guile to take it away and for Caitlin to share his slides. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Adrian. Um, what an un unexpected and pleasant surprise to get us started today. Um, and Thank you, Caitlin, for running the slides, helping out today. As Adrian mentioned, I'm Patrick Giles. I'm the Operating Officer at Breed California. Uh, I'm sure many of you know us, um, but we are a public health uh, nonprofit here in the region uh, with a focus uh, specifically on lung health uh, programs. Um, and that gives us the opportunity to do a lot of cool stuff like this, uh, where we work with great partners like the County Department of Public Health and the Sacramento uh, Air Quality Management District. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we uh, so we have been working with uh, with the Air District on AB 671 since uh, right after legislation was adopted uh, in October of 2019 as a result of the campfire. Um, you'll all recall lots of smoke and uh, lots of reaction. So it was really hard to know exactly what we needed to do at all times in all situations. And there was a clear need for local agencies to coordinate, communicate and have a clear plan when inevitably there would be a next time. So the goal was to develop a coordinated plan uh, that serves as an information source for agencies and the public during wildfire smoke events, uh, but to make sure that that plan uh, was created with the input, uh, the understanding of, of, of what folks experienced, um, where their areas of confusion or uh, lack of, of clear direction existed and uh, what best could be in the plan to make it the most useful and effective um, plan going forward. And um, so, the deliverable for the Air District is the emergency plan that they'll de develop. Uh, it'll be due to the legislature uh, early next year. But in the meantime, uh, Breed gets to keep working with the Air District and the public to continue to understand uh, what folks experience and how to help develop a plan. And uh, we've developed some useful tools, I think, that um, will be you know, useful anytime there's a wildfire smoke event between now and the, the plan being adopted. And 
We'll talk a little bit more of those today. So uh, next slide, please. And um, Amy from the Air District is on the call. She'll recognize these slides. They've been uh, updated a little bit for the presentation today, uh, but she, she masterfully built them. So the plan has four specific elements, uh, health protective recommendations and guidelines, identification of responsible agencies, best practices, for business and public agencies and strategies for vulnerable populations. And uh, we're kind of right in element three right now, uh, best practices for businesses and public agencies. Uh, we've got a survey in the field uh, to understand kind of the conditions around that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But um, for element one to be uh, totally effective for us to put together these protective recommendations and guidelines. We kind of needed to start by identifying responsible agencies. So um, next next slide, please. So um, uh, Amy's great graphic that she's got here, I think, shows the table that we've all come around. And we've got the um, the right groups around the table to inform this kind of plan. County health officer, local emergency services, school districts, regional planning agencies. And we needed to get them around the table so that uh, we could hear from them just what needed to be in protective recommendations and guidelines. So we started out by kind of getting these groups together and hearing from them what their experience was like uh, during the wildfire smoke events and what kind of information they needed. Uh, and, and we really focused heavily on the school districts. We had 13 districts come together um, to inform, you know, what a plan might look like, what elements it might have, and what questions they had. Uh, because at the schools is where a lot of the confusion existed during the wildfire smoke events. Uh, confusion like, you know, um, at what point did the schools shut down? You know, had air quality gotten so bad, do they close? Do they, do they keep students home? Uh, there was a lot of things to consider, like logistics and child care, uh, access to food uh, because of the lunch programs uh, for the students. So all of these things needed to be considered, and that needed to go into a recommendation and guideline. And um, these great agencies have been playing a pivotal role in putting those guidelines together. Uh, next slide, please. And one of the first things we needed to do once we got that group together, um, it, well, it was clear when the group was together that what they, what they needed, probably more than anything else, was a consistent source of information. So these days you can get uh, the AQI off you know, your iPhone if you pull up the weather app. There's purple monitors, there's clarity monitors. Uh, sometimes they'll all tell you something just a little bit different. So uh, one of the, the, the vote most important things to put the plan together was to identify one sole source that we could send people to, and that is, or, or has been, fire.airnow.gov. And that's because there you can see, you know, data from regulatory monitors along with uh, low cost monitors that folks have in their homes. So we have kind of like a, like a large, large scale view and, and a more local scale view. And as you can see, uh, it, it, it has, a, has an effect of, of showing kind of what the local air quality looks like on a national level. And when it gets as bad as it is in the screen grab, it's important to know just exactly uh, what level uh, AQI we're dealing with. Next slide, please. And so <clears throat> with a clear idea of, of you know, what AQI we're working from and, and where we're getting our information, we prepared this uh, air quality action chart specifically for schools. You can see on the left column that it's got a list of some of the, the common outdoor activities that happen at schools uh, with a list of recommendations based on the AQI and the, the color chart that would, you know, would coincide with the scores. Uh, so that schools just know exactly uh, you know, what they should feel comfortable uh, or un not comfortable doing uh, during a wildfire smoke event or what actions they should start to take when they smell or see smoke. Next slide, please. Uh, and so with, you know, that those recommendations and guidelines created, 
um, for the schools and able to send out to them. Uh, you know, we started on element three, best practices for businesses and public agencies. And when I mentioned earlier that, that we're still in that phase, um, we've had convenings, uh, virtual ones during COVID, uh, and sent a survey out into the field to get input on the experience and, and, and needs from uh, business groups like local chambers of commerce, um, uh, trade organizations, PBIDs, uh, business owners that employ uh, or, or, or engage in you know, outdoor work environments like landscaping. Uh, these days, lots of folks in the hospitality industry, especially during the fires of last summer, uh, had folks working and in, in, in dining outdoors. Uh, and so it was important to us that we capture their experience in the survey. Next slide, please. And we have, we've just gotten the survey back, so we're still interpreting those results. We're really, really happy with the amount of participants we got and the feedback we got. We thought it was really helpful. Um, but in the meantime, put together, um, just hearing that there was a need and knowing that it could there could be a wildfire smoke event at any time and people had questions, uh, products like this five-step plan. Um, so, you know, what to do uh, in the most basic five-step plan and, you know, find the air quality with the fire.airnow.gov, uh, review the action charts. So you saw the one for school, there will be one for businesses and one for public agencies. Uh, those two are in development still. Make your plan. Um, so, you know, determine all the steps you're going to take. Communicate the plan, you know, with teachers, students, staff, uh, family members, uh, you know, what to do if there's a wildfire smoke event. And then to implement the plan. Start by checking fire.airnow.gov. Go through the steps that you all have lined out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and then we put together some tools that um, were curtailed to those to those groups. So the one on the left there is one that we created for schools. So they had almost like a flow chart that you could look at. Um, you know, if there was a if there was a smoke event, if they see or smell smoke, they can go through these steps. Uh, you know, look at air quality, um, where they can go to have questions answered, uh, like airquality.org, the Air District's website that will. Uh, has a running list of uh, wildfire, wildfire smoke events that are affecting the Sacramento region. Uh, phone number if they have questions uh, um, and, and information for, for health effects of wildfire smoke exposure, uh, so on. On the right is for uh, outdoor uh, workers and, and employers and, and, and things to avoid to not exacerbate the situation. So Landscaping and construction. Uh, don't kick up extra dust by by leaf blowing or uh, moving dirt. Try to drive slower than normal. Uh, things to protect already fragile air quality and 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 prevent threats to lung health. And then burning and outdoor cooking. Again, excess smoke. So you know, no burn piles. Not you know, uh, running having a fire in your in your chimney. Uh, not running a smoker outdoors if if avoidable. Uh, next slide, please. And so um, those are the steps that we've been taking to put the plan into action, um, you know, trying to get uh, a handle on how public messaging should go, having clear information online, um, talking to individual agencies, business actions, uh, and hearing from schools on needs for about full school uh, monitoring filtration systems and clean air centers. Uh, will all be part of the public messaging. Next slide, please. And so that public messaging, you know, comes from a couple of these sources. Uh, the uh, the idea in the interim between, uh, you know, now and when the plan is handed over is to provide sources to schools, businesses, public agencies, and, and families um, to stay informed during a wildfire smoke event. And you can do that, you know, by going to the airquality.org, the Air District's website, like I said, seeing what fires are affecting the Sacramento region, seeing the, the air quality for the day, seeing if there's any recommendations uh, about how behavior should be changed based on those things or following them on Twitter. 
or, you know, uh, going to the Breathe California website or following us on social media for current conditions, tips for staying safe, uh, and other things to do during wildfire smoke events. And so that's where we're at. Uh, still a work in progress. Like I said, the, the, um, the plan will be handed over to the legislature early next year. And uh, we'll continue to work on elements three and four. And so, um, you know, thank you for your time today. It looks like I have a couple of questions and um, I see Earl's hands up if we want to start there. Thanks, Pat, for that presentation. Uh, I'm curious why the legislature uh, didn't apply this bill statewide. Uh, was there a pushback coming from one quarter or another against doing something like that? Yeah, you know, that is not something I could uh, really speak to. Um, you know, we've, we've, our role has been mostly about helping get feedback and, and provide that there. Uh, if there's anybody on the call from the air district that, you know, could speak to that, uh, you know, happy to hear, hear that. I can, um, I can help you out, uh, uh, Patrick. Uh, thanks, uh, Earl, for the question. It, it was sim simply a matter of practical, uh, a practical approach, uh, Earl. Uh, our, our program, our legislative mandate is a pilot. And um, as a pilot, um, it was really our, our uh, assembly member, uh, Kevin McCarty, who authored the legislation, who saw the need for us to try out this different approach of uh, coordination. So it's simply, it's simply the practical aspect of, of us being, being um, unfortunately, the ones that uh, for that particular event, the campfire, as, as Pat uh, described, uh, we saw quite a bit of, a, of an impact in the, in the, in the capital region. Um, and what I mean by an impact is, is really, um, you know, there was a sense of everybody was running around trying to figure out what to do and, 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 and who, to, who to go to and, and et cetera. So there was, there was quite a bit of a, a commotion, if you will. And, and, you know, a number of elected officials expressed uh, a desire to be more coordinated in the region. I don't know to what extent the same played out in other parts of the region. So that's that, that's how we ended up with uh, 661. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I see that uh, Brandon asked, uh, do we delineate any of the various mission adjustments in what AQI number to use from the AirNow website or Purple Air? Um, I, I hate to deflect these questions, but Brandon, that's a little more technical than I, I really uh, am prepared to answer. But I do know that one of the benefits of the fire.air now uh, website is, is that the purple air monitors, you know, have been adjusted. Um, so it's not just the straight, it's not just the straightforward data that you would just see, um, but they are, there is a, a, an algorithm, I think is what they use to, to kind of make that adjustment there. Uh, a question from Jim Kennedy. How about the current AB 619 on lung health and fire smoke? Uh, thanks for sharing the fact sheet because that is something I would need to get uh, a little bit smarter about uh, here. We have been uh, tracking that one a little bit, but um, I appreciate you sharing. Looks like Bill, Bill Mueller's wondering which counties this covers. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, my, uh, as far as I am, I know it'd be Sacramento County um, as far as a, a plan goes, but again, maybe Alberto, you could, uh, it looks like that's, that's what he's saying. So like these tools, for example, uh, just to get to the next question about final drafts, uh, the, the tools I shared today are available on the Air District's website. So, um, you know, they're not proprietary. We wanted to make sure that they're available for like the public benefit in case there's a wildfire smoke event and, and folks are, you know, have, have resources, you know, at, in, in their hands uh, when they need them. Uh, we are working on translating them into the eight threshold languages as we speak. So they're available to, to more people in the region. Um, and, and in Sacramento County. Um, 
So uh, they are kind of a work in progress in that way. And then, um, like I said, there's more more products being developed as we continue the outreach process. So we'll have uh, uh, activity charts for business and public agencies coming soon. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pat. Looks like really important coordination work happening in Sacramento County and, and something for those of us outside of Sacramento County, uh, whether we're in the region or, or outside of it, to pay attention. All right. Any other questions? Thanks, Adrian. Great. Okay. Well, uh, we have our, our other Pat, Pat number one, I'm going to call you um, <laughs> with us now. Apologies for the, the technical issues, um, Pat, but would love to turn it over to you now. We've heard sort of about the, you know, what's happening at, in Sacramento County, the more urban scale with emergency response. But of course, you know, we want to prevent these things from happening in the first place, right? So what are what are, are are you able to share with respect to what's been going on in El Dorado County? And I, I understand we have slides to share. I uh, would love for you to take it away. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Adrian, and thank you for the technical assistance. Uh, uh, and I guess in order of sequence, I'm really Pat number two. But um, I'd Fair like enough. to tell you. <laughs> I'd like to tell you a little bit about the El Dorado County efforts and the El Dorado County Fire Safe Council. Um, the council's actually been in existence since 2002, so pushing 20 years now. Um, and it, we regret perhaps having county in our title because a lot of people affiliate us with the, the county of Sacramento, and that's simply a geographic description in our, in our name. Um, we're, we're really a 501c3 nonprofit standalone public benefit corporation. And most importantly, we're an all volunteer force. So we have no paid staff, uh, a bunch of uh, gray hairs working off their kitchen tables with laptops. And I'd like to tell you about a few of the accomplishments. We're pretty proud of, of what we've done. I also should extend a thank you to Dave Johnson who couldn't join the group today. Uh, for uh, kind of hooking me up with y'all uh, and giving me this opportunity. And thank you to the members of the uh, Clean Air Partnership. Okay, next slide. Good news, I only have 10 slides. The bad news is they're 20 minutes each. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> so the, our mission uh, is, as you see, to protect the people uh, from the um, results of catastrophic wildfire through four, four pinnacles, four, four stove pipes, uh, education, cooperation, innovation, and action. And we've done a lot of education. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we have great cooperation from the fire agencies, CAL FIRE, PG&E, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and we've got a lot of action through our 25, 26, um, uh, community fire safe councils that are under our umbrella. And we're still working on something to be innovative, but I'm sure we'll come up with it. Next slide, please. So our whole philosophy and I, as a volunteer organization is we're truly a bottoms up group. It's not a top down telling people what to do and how to do it. We try to get uh, homeowner and community cooperation to want to do the right things. So we help homeowners and help is the operative word, fulfill our responsibility to create a defensible space and then harden their homes. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in a couple of slides. And we also help communities, uh, not necessarily incorporated communities, but they could be homeowners association, property owner association, just, um, little communities like mine, uh, which is Logtown. And I know you're all saying, where's Logtown? Well, I'll tell you, it's halfway between Mud Springs and Pokerville. So I hope that clears things up. <laughs> Actually, you probably all know it's, uh, uh, I'll give you a landmark, it's three miles south of Poor Reds. So um, we do help communities um, 
create a network, a communication network, um, sometimes phone trees to alert people of potential wildfires or wildfires that could affect the area. And uh, we also do um, a CWPP, Community Wildfire Protection Plans um, for each of the communities we represent. Uh, the last one, and it's, it's a big deal. Um, it has to be approved by all the fire district and CAL FIRE and the Board of Supervisors. And it's just a plan that lays out where are the risks for wildfire and what can we do to mitigate them in terms of roadside clearance or fuel reduction and that sort of thing. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll go backwards a little bit and talk about all of the fire communities we deal with. Um, the Fire Safe Council is really a truly a California organization. At one time, it was a subset of CDF, California Department of Forestry, before it became uh, CAL FIRE. And it had support from insurance companies, and they spun it off to be a statewide nonprofit so that they could apply for and receive federal grants and grants from uh, private industry like PG&E. Uh, on the East Coast, um, they had FireWise communities. And the FireWise really were um, created by NFPA, the National Fire Prevention Association, which is really insurance companies. And their focus was on hardening homes. What can you do to not use wood siding, cover your gutters, your non-flammable roof material, that sort of thing. While the Fire Safe Council was more focused on defensible space and vegetation control and that sort of thing. Uh, and then up popped the fire adapted communities after the damaging fires in Colorado. And their focus was on evacuation preparedness. And the truth is you need all three, leg all three legs on that stool. You need to do all three things. So we've incorporated all those national ideas into our, our approach. Next slide. So here's uh, just a quick shot of El Dorado County, uh, Western slope of El Dorado County. Uh, once you cross the summit and go into the Tahoe Basin, there's a whole different set of uh, uh, regulations and rules. And so we represent uh, the Western slope, communities on the Western slope. And you can see them listed there. They go all the way from Volcanoville in the north down to Logtown in the south, uh, Lake Hills Estates on the, on the west, and good old Grizzly Flats on the east, and then all points in between. Again, these are grassroots, local, kitchen table, community councils getting together saying, what can we do to help our community uh, be safe from wildfire? Next slide. So we're focused on the preparation plans that uh, are actually being updated right now, as I said. We do have community cleanup days, so we have chipper and dumpster program, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, fuel reduction projects, those are mostly done through grants, uh, and we've been very successful. And then the education and outreach, um, we're coming of age, uh, putting our toe into the social media next door, that kind of thing to try to get uh, um, into the, the 21st century uh, and uh, communicate uh, via other than with flyers and posters and that sort of thing. Okay, next. Next slide, please. Okay, thanks. So we try to uh, assist, I'm sorry, back up one. We try to assist the residents and help them do what is really their responsibility under public resources code uh, to clear defensible space around their homes. And the way we've done that is we have a, a countywide chipping program where people clean the area within 100 feet of their structure, 
uh, limb up trees, remove the brush, uh, and then pull it out to their driveway or to the roadside. Uh, they fill out an online request form, and within two weeks, uh, a contractor comes and chips some material. And they leave the chips um, on the property, either broadcast them or just pile them. So in the 12 months between June of 2020 and July of 2021, we did almost a thousand of those chipping jobs um, and that 200, almost 300,000 cubic yards of materials was chipped. And that's, that's important because about 85, 65% uh, of the people that when they fill out the form, we said, if the chipping wasn't available, what would you do with this material? And over 60%, between 60 and 70 said they burn it. So we really have, as Patrick said before me, to help air quality, there's are uh, hundreds of thousands of cubic yards that are not burned uh, and are chipped. And the chips are then used to, um, uh, by the homeowner to control um, uh, erosion or keep weeds down and uh, improve the, the watershed. So it's kind of a win-win situation. The other thing we do is uh, assist communities. I said we had that wildfire protection plan and in there are a list of projects, um, probably 100 to 300 acres uh, for each of the projects. And once they're identified, it's the community that has to submit grants. And we assist them in that by helping doing grant writing classes. And we have a grants committee to do a peer review. And we've been very, very successful. In the past five years, we've got 30 grants totaling almost $5 million. Um, uh, and also we've received national recognition for five out of the last six years for our efforts. So um, pretty successful for a bunch of old, old people. Next, um, next slide. And so we have, you know, the Patrick's presentation on what to do when there's a, a wildfire smoke in the community. Well, our goal is to not have the wildfires. Or per, you know, it's it's unreasonable for us to believe that we could um, stop a fire like the campfire. I, I they're so situational. But uh, in the Amador El Dorado County AEU of Cal Fire, there were about 600 wildfires last year, and uh, over 90 percent of them were contained to 10 acres or less. So a lot of that is the homeowners and property owners doing what they need to do to give the firefighters a chance and keep small fires fire, uh, small. So that's, that's pretty important. And then I al already mentioned about reducing ignition from pile burning. Um, that 147,000 uh, cubic yards last year that was chipped and would have been burned if we wouldn't have chipped it. Next slide. So we have all the challenges of pretty much any organization, especially uh, all volunteer. Uh, in the communities, we have the challenge of ap apathy. People just, some people just don't care. And so it's hard to convince them to do what they need to do, even with our assistance. Uh, we have a lot of absentee property owners and vacant parcels uh, that are really um, not good stewards of the land, uh, they're more investors and so it's hard to get their attention. Uh, and then being all volunteer force, we have volunteer burnout. People say, hey, I retired to, to go play golf or go fishing. I don't, I don't need to have these 300 emails every day. Um, we have to nurture our collaborations uh, and build sustaining support. And you can read the rest of them off the, off the slide. And the last bullet is we're kind of a victim of our own success. Uh, as I mentioned, we had 30 projects, uh, $5 million, and managing that with an all-volunteer force is difficult. We enlist the aid of the uh, Resources Conservation District, who've been a great partner, uh, and I think we'll see more partnerships in that area. Next slide. 
So we're, we're, like I said, a victim of our own success uh, with all of the interest on wildfire and uh, uh, the global warming um, we've been, or climate change, there's, there's been a flood of funding. We've gone through some pretty lean years and now there's a lot of people lining up trying to give us money and we wanna make sure we use that, those funds efficiently and, and for what they're intended. Next slide. So things are looking up. Um, we've got a lot of agencies and people engaged. Um, we're kind of a thing in El Dorado County and we wanna to continue to make a positive uh, contribution both on wildfire safety and, and air quality. So um, thank you very much for your attention and uh, I guess it's a good time to open up to questions. Thanks so much, Pat. Um, so reminder to folks, if you do have questions, you know, raise your hand. Again, you can do that via the reactions um, um, button on your screen. Uh, but I, I know I have a question maybe to kick it off before uh, passing it to Bill. Um, curious, you talked a lot about the funding side of things, but beyond providing funding, what can, you know, for example, the feds and the state do to, to help you with, with what you're doing currently? Well, I think it on the, we'll start at the bottom. On the county level, it's taken a long time, but the county finally has a vegetation management ordinance, which they never did before because El Dorado County evolved from ranchers and farmers and, and vineyards that were good stewards of the land and didn't feel like we needed it. But as I mentioned, now there are a lot of um, uh, investors and absentee landowners. Uh, so the vegetation management ordinance is a big help. I think uh, fully funding, not only the fire response at both the state and federal level, you know, the air tankers and the uh, fire apparatus and the more, most importantly, the staffing to operate those things uh, is certainly important, but it's always been unbalanced. It's always been um, the old pound a cure and uh, we haven't ever got the ounce of prevention. So I think I'd like to see a lot more um, funds go into the prevention side, not necessarily to our fire safe council, but um, through multi-agency efforts. And it looks like we have a question from Bill. Yeah, thanks Adrian. Uh, Pat, I'm calling you from Lotus, California, and really appreciate all the service that you and your volunteers are doing up here to keep us safe. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we love Lotus. <laughs> so do we. <laughs> so, um, I'm, but I'm curious, I, I hear that you're very busy. Um, are your efforts just within that map that we saw? Because we probably need your help in Placer County, in Calaveras County, and in, in lots of other places. So are there similar fire councils there? Yes, um, thank you for that. There is a, I said we were an umbrella organization for our communities like Lotus on the Western Slope, um, but there's also a statewide umbrella organization that's also a nonprofit, the California State uh, Fire Safe Council very loosely knit, um, but each county has evolved to have their own um, vision of a fire safe council. And each county is different. Some that have consolidated fire districts, the fire safe council is part of a, of a countywide fire district. Here in El Dorado, as you know, we have nine different uh, fire protection districts and about seven of them are near bankruptcy. So uh, it's, they're not likely to take on another mission. Uh, in other counties, uh, Fire State Council is part of the Resources Conservation District, the RCD. Uh, so they're all, they're all different. There are Fire State Councils, a good one in Nevada County, uh, very active, and some counties are more active than others. I, no, I, I don't think we have the capacity to reach out beyond our borders and, and you know, we have to help ourselves before we can help our neighbors. So, good question. Thank you. 
And it looks like uh, Tara added in the chat that Yolo County is forming its own umbrella organization with a couple of F FSDs, at least a couple of FSDs. So that, that is awesome to hear. I don't know if Terry, you have anything to add or, if, or uh, any way we can sort of stay tuned with that effort too in our region? Oh, I'll, yes, I can share. So this has been in the works for a few years and the county received a grant from, I think the California Fire Safe Council to get it set up. And right now we're meeting monthly and it's been pretty incredible, 50 people attending these monthly meetings to try to set it up. But um, the umbrella, I think it's similar to what we just heard. The umbrella organization, it's being chaired by the fire chief from um, Yocha de Hay Fire Department. And then also the Winters Fire Department is the co-chair or is the vice chair. And um, that, that, that entity, the larger umbrella entity is envisioned to be the fiscal agent, to be the one that goes after the grants and have the structure for that grant reporting. I see Pat nodding, so it seems very similar. But then the, um, the smaller groups like the, the greater Winters area, that's, that's the grassroots community led and what we're talking about is they need to identify projects and, and we're in parallel, we're also working on that, um, the CWPP. So we're, we're a couple of decades behind Pat, but uh, working on it. And a lot of this, we knew it was coming, but for what's interesting in this one is the greater winters area, we're intentionally going to go beyond jurisdictional boundaries because some people with the winters address and frankly are within the winter school district actually live in Solano County across the Creek. And they all consider themselves as part of the winter's community, especially um, as we responded from the LNU uh, lightning complex fire that really devastated some folks along Pleasants Valley Road, just south of um, Yolo County and Solano County. So actively working um, to find resources, but yeah, as Pat said, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of it's about fuel reduction and doing that preventative. And, and I'll just share one more thing. Um, community members, we did some listening sessions actually with Meg Arnold uh, last fall, but um, connected here. And one of the main things we heard is some of these communities have evacuated five out of the last six years, but they said this fire was different than any other. And um, part of that was just how fast and aggressive it was. And the other piece was Cal Fire was so spread thin throughout the state, whereas other fires in Yolo County, we've had hundreds of vehicles out there defending it. And this year it was one volunteer firefighter in some sections, um, defending space and property and, and people. So as much preventative work as we can do for fuel reduction, I think is, is key moving forward. Great, that was uh, good. Thank you for the question and the comments. Um, let me volunteer to say that uh, in our chipping program, we spent years developing the software and the database and how people can apply for chipping online and how we man uh, generate job tickets to the contractors. and we're happy to share that for free with anybody that, that wants it. Uh, we think it's a good program. You could probably even make improvements to it, but uh, it's a good starting point. So if you want to develop a chipping program, uh, that's, uh, that's great. Um, and the same goes for any of the attendees that want more information about CWPPs or whatever, please uh, contact me. I should have put my email on the first slide. It's uh, rpd123 at att.net. Thanks so much. Um, I, I do have another question. It looks like Chris Norum has his hand raised, but I wanted to get a quick one in. Um, we have some utilities folks, including folks from SMUD and PG&E on the call today. How do you work with the utilities? Um, is, that, is that an easy for you? Is it difficult? It's, it's very, uh, we're very, very lucky that both SMUD and PG&E uh, have been great partners. Uh, a SMUD representative sits on our board uh, and SMUD has transmission lines that come from Ice House uh, all the way down through to Folsom. And they've been very good stewards in maintaining those lines, clearing the vegetation. As a matter of fact, the, the transmission lines themselves, the vegetation removal, have created a fire break for the rest of the community. And, and the same is true for PG&E. I know it's, it's popular to, to bad mouth and uh, take pot shots at PG&E, um, but they have really stepped up their game in doing the same thing, removing vegetation 
um, very aggressively from around transmission lines and also around the neighborhood distribution lines, which really helps because most of those are along roadways. So that helps on our evacuation routes and we do work um, very closely with both of those utilities. Great. Well, let's hear from Chris Norum. He has his hand raised. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm just, I think, first of all, congratulations on all your great work, which is so sorely needed for all the reasons we're all well too familiar with. Um, but you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, all the work you're doing, but I'm wondering how does that, the number you gave us some really great numbers earlier, how does that compare to the overall scope of kind of the work that's needed to do the thing? Because there's just such an epic amount overall in the Sierra, right? So how, how would you categorize like the, the work that you're doing, chipping away at the problem, uh, compared to the overall amount that's needed? And how would, if we were to try to go find some other way to try to create more resources through a cap to cap or what, what, what would that, what forms would that look like? I think um, our, our focus has been, as I said, at the community level. And so we're small potatoes. We're just a drop in the bucket in terms of what needs to be done in, in vegetation management, not only in our county uh, on private lands, but also the National for El Dorado National Forest. Um, and I think you're seeing, we're seeing um, a move toward more landscape size um, projects where we used to be happy with a $100,000 grant to do uh, maybe 50 acres, because that's about the going rate is about two, two grand an acre. Um, now we're seeing millions of dollars in grants. We have a BLM grant for 900 and some thousand dollars in the Georgetown area. So the projects are getting bigger. Uh, the, real, the real trick is to manage those projects effectively and then tie them in to the other efforts being made on the national forest. So we really end up with a, a landscape size vision as opposed to a, a bunch of postage stamps stuck haphazardly around the, the county. Uh, the new forest supervisor, uh, Jeff, an unpronounceable last name, um, is Marcialis, I think, Jeff. He is um, very much in tune with that. He's a landscape vision kind of guy. Uh, and and I think making us think bigger than we have in the past. So good question. And we, as far as what can we do with cap to cap, um, I'll leave that in the legislators' hands. Uh, we can certainly in, write and um, send letters of support um, of those kind of things. But uh, yeah, we'll leave it there. Well, if you're getting grant money from BLM, I mean, maybe we can plus up those grant, if there's already an, uh, an avenue of getting that money out there. When you, let me just ask one other quick question. When you do get those grants like from BLM or Forest Service, is that on Forest Service or BLM land or is it private or both? Yes, it's, a, it's both actually. Uh, and we also have under the Stevens Authority, we have uh, grants through the US Forest Service uh, to do specific projects um, adjacent to the, federal forest or, or even on the forest, um, adjacent being kind of a, a loose term. Got it. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Pat, for that, that excellent presentation about, about the great work that you're doing in El Dorado County. Um, definitely interested in following up uh, on behalf of the Peanut Air Partnership and to all who are interested in, in um, you know, just one-on-one -on -one follow ups, uh, I, I did put Pat's email in the chat box. So thank you again, Pat. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you. So before we go to our uh, last but not least speaker, Vanessa Walker, uh, I'm gonna do a, a second poll real quick. And this is really to gauge um, interest in uh, sort of a potential in-person event for our next go around here at the Cleaner Air Partnership. So um, let me go to our second poll and launch this. And then it should be on your screen now. Um, just trying to gauge, you know, if we were to have a, another, our next luncheon in, um, let's say the September, August, September area, um, how comfortable would you be gathering in person? 
uh, with or without masks. And I see I spelled masks uh, incorrectly on that first option, so I apologize. Um, and then I'll, I'll share the polling. So I'm going to leave it open for another five, four, three, two, one. Okay. So here are your results. It looks like a majority are comfortable with a marks not required. Again, that should be masks not required in person meeting um, with with sizable, uh, you know, significant numbers of folks interested in in you know mask wearing and potentially doing an outdoor event or or not interested in an in person event at all. And I think that speaks to the importance of us continuing to have hybrid options for folks. Um, so that'll be, a, I think, a unique challenge in, you know, just trying to make sure that there is meaningful opportunities for folks to engage uh, as part of these meetings when they're not, you know, potentially at an in-person event. So uh, would love if folks have creative solutions or, or maybe models that they've seen for really compelling hybrid events, reach out to me. I am all ears and I'd love to, you know, take those learnings and, you know, apply them as we as we move forward with these quarterly launches. So thank you for the feedback. We do, we do really you know, review this and take it count. Um, okay, then. So last but not least, uh, we have Vanessa Walker with Sutter Health. Vanessa, would you be interested in uh, introducing yourself and then giving us some more context around, you know, we've, we've talked about the prevention of wildfire and smoke. We've talked about how, you know, folks in Sacramento County specifically are adapting and planning for the, those emergencies. But what about the impact itself? What, what does it actually do to the body? What are we trying to prevent? <laughs> Um, curious to hear from you. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for, for having me, everybody. Um, yeah, it's an honor to represent Sutter Health. I am a pulmonary and critical care physician. I practice at Sutter Roseville Medical Center predominantly, um, as well as I am the medical director for the Sutter Health Valley Area Electronic ICU, which um, helps to deliver critical care across uh, the entire Valley service line, which runs all the way up to uh, Crescent City, Nevada. Um, down to Los Banos. So uh, we have a pretty widespread uh, through our EICU. But my role here is to represent um, uh, as a pulmonary physician, not necessarily as a critical care physician. And looking at the way that wildfire smoke affects the body. So we know that uh, any kind of air pollution can affect people, especially that have underlying pulmonary conditions, things like asthma, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, people with coronary artery disease or heart failure, um, and women that are pregnant um, can all be affected by poor air quality. But in particular, wildfire smoke is even more dangerous than your typical air pollutants. And it's predominantly because of the, uh, the high impact of the PM 2.5s or the particulate matter 2.5 microns that are within the uh, wildfire smoke, <clears throat> as well as what is typically burned in wildfires. If the wildfires just stayed um, to the happy little grasses and trees, may not be as bad, but usually they roar through structures burning homes and uh, bringing up all kinds of pollutants and chemicals um, as they burn plastics and, and uh, various other fuels. So wildfires are incredibly dangerous to the body. So what are some of the things they can do? So for, uh, for people with underlying respiratory illnesses, like I said, asthma, COPD, things like that, um, it can cause an, a flare up or an exacerbation of those medical conditions. So um, most people, when, they're, when they have well-controlled respiratory diseases, they use inhalers or various other medications that keep their airways open and keep inflammation down. But when there's high amounts of that particulate, uh, the 2.5 PM uh, particulates in the air, um, those deposit deeply into the lungs and the lungs respond by releasing pro-inflammatory chemicals. Um, they are, they're, they're, the body is trying to recruit white blood cells to the area because it says, hey, there's something in these lungs, I don't like it and you need to get rid of it. So that's what the body's trying to do. The problem is, is that this, that also um, brings in inflammation into the lungs and that can set off the airways to bronchospasm, meaning collapse down, get very, very tight, leading to wheezing, coughing, shortness of breath, um, and unfortunately increase in hospitalizations um, and uh, other uh, bad side effects of that. Um, Children in particular are also heavily affected, especially because their airways are already so tiny. So when you have, imagine a tube, 
that's very small, like a little kid, they don't have a lot of room to bronchospasm down. And so little kids get uh, wheezy very quickly, even in response to small amounts of particulate matter. Uh, people with underlying heart disease, they can have an exacerbation of uh, heart failure or even it can precipitate a heart attack simply because of the inflammation that is set off in the body by exposure to wildfire smoke. Uh, pregnant women, especially um, if they're not quite far enough along in their in their pregnancy to go into labor, but it can it can pre, uh, um, get, cause a woman to go into uh, preterm labor, which unfortunately affects the woman and the newborn baby who might be born with lungs that are not mature enough yet to, to come into this world and other organs that are not ready to come into this world. So it can have a pretty devastating impact on our uh, on our community. So then we go to how well you know. I'm, we appreciate, I appreciate as a healthcare provider, everything you all are doing to prevent the wildfires. Um, but when they come on, what can our community do to protect themselves from the wildfire smoke? So the number one thing they can do if they have the ability is to stay indoors, decrease the amount of airflow that is being brought into the home um, uh, through external vents where, you know, if somebody has a whole house fan, things like that, that's trying to bring in fresh air from the outside avoid that. You want to try to circulate the air that's inside the home. Make sure that your make sure that your internal air filters are nice and clean um, so they can try to um, you know filter out the air as much as possible. Purchase external um, uh, uh, portable air cleaning devices. Those are also good. People that are particularly vulnerable, very severe COPD, very severe asthmatics, might even consider setting up what's called a clean room where they identify a room within their home that's small, has good circulation, and they actually, um, no curtains, um, no carpet. You don't want something that's going to pick up particulates and, and help uh, spread those throughout the home. So you actually want to identify this clean room and put in a portable uh, air cleaning device. And that would be your room that you would kind of hang out in um, uh, during those events. Now, if you do not have access to air conditioning in your room, your home is unsafe, that's when you would go to uh, various designated uh, safe sites throughout your county where they have hopefully air conditioning and, and clean air uh, for those people that are vulnerable that don't have the resources to stay inside an air conditioned home. Um, then you look at the masks, right? We've been seeing lots of, of masks and unfortunately masks have become an incredibly polarizing topic in the era of COVID. Um, especially when you start talking about how a, a regular medical mask or paper mask that you buy at Home Depot or something or get online, that is not going to help you against wildfire smoke. Um, and it's because the particulates are so small that 2.5 microns and the amount in the air is overwhelming. And so a lot of people get caught up in this because they think, well, you told me that I can wear a medical mask and protect myself from COVID, but you're telling me that the medical mask is not going to protect me from wildfire smoke. And I'm, my answer is yes to both. And there's a big reason for that. If there were the amount of COVID particles in the air that are equivalent to the amount of particles that are from a wildfire, you're absolutely right. That mask would do absolutely nothing for you. What you do with COVID in protecting you from those masks is the majority of the microns, the particles that cause COVID are actually carried on droplets, which are bigger than the 0.25 microns and are usually deflected by um, your, your masks, these paper masks that you purchase. But in wildfire smoke, if you wanna wear a mask and protect yourself, the only mask that's gonna be of help is going to be um, an N95, a NIOSH mask, N95 or a P100 mask that you can purchase online at the hardware store, various places. It needs to have two straps. Um, it needs to completely cover your nose and your chin and be well fitted to your face for it to be effective. Um, unfortunately, these masks are not made for children. They don't size them for children. So you don't have the ability um, to protect your kids. That's why for kids, the best thing to do is to keep them indoors. Um, and then if you have any underlying pulmonary conditions like COPD, um, you are at high risk of retaining carbon dioxide when you're wearing these masks. So you would want to limit the amount of time you spend um, wearing them because it could actually um, impair your breathing. Uh, so that's kind of a brief overview. I know it was a high, <laughs> lots of stuff I threw at you. I'm happy to answer any questions you all may have. Is there really no way for kids to have those effective masks? Is it just because there's so many different like sizes that would need to be made? Is that the reasoning? 
Yeah, they really don't make um, N95 masks for children's size faces. Um, so uh, the, most of the ones that you get, I, uh, the, the K95 masks can be made um, in child sizes, but they're uh, the, only a strap that goes over the ears. Um, they're, they're just not as good. However, um, you know, perhaps it's better than nothing. If you if you've got a kid that has to be outdoors, I would maybe endorse a K95. Um, that's actually what I give my children when they're out and about to prevent to, to protect them from COVID. Um, uh, so you know, it's it's an option. Gotcha. Yeah, I encourage folks to to raise their hands if they have questions for Vanessa. I, I have another one, which is you, you talked about sort of like the the short term impacts. Um, COPD and, and, and other health impacts that happen almost immediately when you breathe in wildfire smoke. Is there research around what it does long term, like connectivity to cancer or other illnesses? Yeah, so that's where the research is appallingly bad. We do not have great research on long term effects of wildfire smoke. There is um, uh, perhaps one of the better studies, which, like I said, is not great. From 1997, when there was the large Indonesian fires, um, they actually looked at um, uh, young men there that were heavily exposed to smoke, and they followed them 10 years later. They had an increased risk of uh, respiratory illnesses, so having um, developed asthma or various other respiratory conditions. So, um, But you would think, with the massive amount of wildfires that have been roaring through the West for years, that we would have better research on long-term effects. And we simply don't have a lot of um, uh, research on long-term effects. Um, I, I, I would say that when you're looking at, uh, you know, cigarette smoke and exposure to cigarette smoke um, causing lung cancer, that is in order to be at risk for lung cancer. I mean, no, no cigarette smoking is good cigarette smoking, right? We don't want anybody to smoke. But the ones that we start lung cancer screening on are people that have had what are called 20 pack year smoking exposure. That means 20 years at one pack per day or 10 years at two packs per day. It's whatever, however many years times the pack per day that usage. And so if you're at over 20 pack years, um, then you are at somebody that we would screen for lung cancer because you would be at high risk. The amount of wildfire smoke you would need to be exposed to, to be the equivalent of 20 pack years is it's phenomenal. No one is exposed to that level of smoke, except for perhaps firefighters, but even they are protected. They're wearing the appropriate gear. There are studies that have looked at firefighters because they have been in, uh, in high uh, exposure to smoke. And yes, firefighters or people that are, we know very well that our, our first responders that went into 9-11 um, and risked their lives have long-term permanent lung damage due to all of that high particulate matter that they breathe into the lungs and led to intense inflammation. And then unfortunately they developed not necessarily cancers, but severe debilitating um, fibrotic, fibrotic disease, which is lung scarring. Um, and then just really bad asthma or chronic um, uh, just inflammation. So lots of bad things happen when you're exposed to wildfire smoke. Um, and we wanna to try to avoid that at all costs. Gotcha. Looks like uh, Bill Mueller has his hand raised. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, so, Dr. Walker, you gave so much information so quickly, and it was so good. Uh, I just want to compliment you because Thank you. there's a lot of information out there, but it's not great, or it's all over the map. So your clarity was just, it was fabulous. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and, and my question is, um, on, the, on the path of the, the science of this, um, I, there was a well-publicized study that came out, and I think it was publicized in Nature, came out in March of this year on wildfire smoke, and it wasn't the long-term effects. It was, hey, the toxicity of smoke is like five times worse than what we thought it was previously. And I wonder if you could reflect on that, whether you've had a chance to look at that study, or is, is that sort of shaping health, health guidance today? So I don't know that it's going to be um, shaping our health guidance, but absolutely the amount of particulate matter that is coming out of wildfire smoke um, is 
10 times more the um, uh, amount of particulate matter that comes out of any other form of pollution. Uh, so we know that wildfire smoke is hands down the worst type of pollution for our, um, uh, for our lungs, for our bodies. So trying to avoid it um, is really, really key. Um, they, there was an additional study, um, I'm trying to remember exactly where this one came out, um, but the, the babies, they were actually looking at children that were born in a year in particularly bad wildfire uh, uh, exposures. They were 30% more likely to have increased uh, problems with breeding than the babies that were born the following year that were not exposed to that level of wildfire smoke. So we know that this is going to cause problem. And in children in particular, if you um, cause damage to them at an early age and set off inflammation at an early age, you might then predispose them to further complications down the line because you're just setting up all of that inflammation and their immune systems are, um, are affected by wildfire smoke, setting them up at higher risk of getting other illnesses. This was my whole last year, something I was very terrified about having to deal with people with COVID um, in the ICU and caring for them for the last you know 15 plus months. Um, the wildfire smoke on top of COVID um, was just really terrifying because the, the wildfire smoke sets up high levels of inflammation. And then when you get COVID on top of that, COVID is an inflammatory disease and that's where it kills people is with the intense inflammation that it causes. Thank you, that was great, appreciate it. Other, other questions for Vanessa before we transition? Well, I, I have one more then. Um, Vanessa, have you guys at Sutter Health changed your approach to, you know, uh, provide delivering healthcare services like in preparation for this year's um, likely wildfires? So one of the things that we um, are very proud of at Sutter Health is our rapid expansion throughout the past uh, year of our telemedicine uh, care delivery. So um, we now will be able, we, we have been able to reach more patients than we ever have before simply by our ability to provide uh, virtual health care. So that if you are having an asthma exacerbation or you're having some health problem that you need to see a provider for, we're not going to make you trek through the wildfire smoke to come see us. We'll virtually come into your home and help take care of you there. Um, so that's one way in which Sutter Health has really responded. Um, Otherwise, you know, uh, in certain areas, we have respiratory clinics that we had set up, um, particularly trying to deliver care for COVID, but uh, through uh, that will set up and, and be able to provide us care for any respiratory illness that, that comes along. Uh, but I think beyond that, I, I'm not sure of any other um, programs that we have, um, other than we have incredible capacity uh, to flex in the event of a disaster. Um, that is one thing that COVID has, has provided, I think all health systems, um, is this ability to rise to a challenge in the middle of a pandemic. Um, now, if it's a wildfire and you get a bunch of people that are burn victims or smoke inhalation victims coming in, we have the ability to rapidly triage them and use our integrated health system to deliver them to where they need to go and provide care um, in any location you're at within uh, our region. Thank you. And, and I'm sure broadband availability is a big factor in the... Yeah. The ICU situation, but thanks for that. It looks like, um, and this might be ask this be our last question. Ralph Proper, go ahead. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention, uh, I was at a, a CARB uh, research seminar a couple of years ago that showed, uh, talking about uh, a monkey colony outdoors at UC Davis that uh, they've had for several years. And uh, they found that uh, long-term, the major, the major finding they had was uh, that uh, the young monkeys that were exposed to the uh, to the smoke that occurred at Davis some years back, I forget which wildfire, uh, had uh, impaired lung development. Uh, their lungs didn't develop the way that uh, adult monkey lungs usually were. Just thought I'd pass that on. Absolutely. And immune system function as well. So we're not just looking at the lungs. We're also, they're, they're seeing impairment in um, immune system function. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thanks all for those questions for Vanessa. Vanessa, do you have any, any closing thoughts before we transition? No, I think that's it.
Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us today. That was, that was really insightful, mm -hmm. as, as Mr. Mueller said. Okay, folks. Well, uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. Before we actually close, um, want to, well, actually, uh, our friend Chris Norum from North State BIA invoked cap to cap. So just wanted to touch base with you all on that. Um, prior to, to uh, well, I'm about to invite Brandon Black with the Metro Chamber to provide some info on the upcoming fall 2021 cap to cap program. But before that, um, our most recent cap luncheon here, here at the Cleaner Air Partnership was on the topic of federal air quality advocacy. And of course, we we all talked about priorities that we wanted to elevate for that, that effort that we that we underwent at the end of April and at the beginning of, of May. And we appreciate those of you who were able to join us for those meetings. Again, we had 14 meetings in five days, uh, a lot of really, really uh, good um, meetings and relationships built with many new faces at the federal level. And we're really, really excited to continue those conversations and continue that advocacy this fall through the, the Metro Chamber's regular effort. So um, I'm about to, to throw it over to Brandon, but I just wanted to share uh, in the chat uh, you can read the, the final papers that were developed as part of our, you know, our effort on the Valley Vision website. We'll just paste it there. Uh, and, and again, they're, they're very informative, and I think they really do reflect kind of the priorities that we talked, that we've all been working toward as a region, but also what we talked about back in March. So um, with that, again, that trying to build the link to, to the fall effort, um, and really excited for that, and hope that you'll join us for it. So Brandon, would you like to provide some info on, on what, what is planned for, for this fall? Sure, sure. Thank you, Adrian. Appreciate it. So yes, we are back with cap to cap for 2021. I did put a link in the chat for those that are interested in registering. I uh, would certainly love to have you uh, join us for the virtual program this year. So you know the dates are October 25th through the 29th. Our cap to cap teams have started meeting already. Uh, the Clean Air, Clean Air Partnership certainly uh, with their effort, their federal advocacy effort, I think that uh, our air quality group is well in line and, and well positioned to uh, quickly move into the advocacy phase of, of this program. Really, really looking forward to it. Uh, we're going to have a good time. There is going to be an in-person component at the very end of the program. We will have an all-delegation reception here in Sacramento, uh, and this will, this will continue to feed into uh, the 50th anniversary cap to cap which will take place in person back in Washington, D.C., uh, in, in May, beginning of May of, of 2022. Uh, but we are very, very excited to get this program off the ground and running, even in a virtual com uh, capacity. I think it's gonna be just, just an excellent, excellent opportunity to get in front of our federal colleagues and to let them know what's going on right back here in Sacramento and hopefully draw down some dollars for the region. So with that, if there's any questions, happy to help answer them. Again, teams are meeting now to figure out their issue papers and our, our hot topics for the year. Uh, that, that work is ongoing. Uh, we, are, we are starting to see meeting requests and all those fun things are starting to roll in as we speak. So uh, we did hire a cap to cap scheduler. Uh, this week was his first week. He's getting his feet wet and starting to figure all this stuff out. Uh, and again, just really, really looking forward to bringing this group back uh, to help advocate for the Sacramento region back to Washington, DC. With that, any questions, happy to help answer them. Again, registration link is in the chat and really looking forward to seeing a lot of these faces on some virtual calls here. And would really love to see you all in person for the all delegation reception. Thanks, Brandon. And yeah, for, for those who, who have not attended, cap to cap really is the premier regional federal advocacy push um, that I, I believe is, it'll be, you'll be celebrating your 50th anniversary next year, correct? We will be celebrating the 50th anniversary of cap to cap next year. Uh, there's a, a very long history in this region of this program being very effective in drawing down dollars and support from our federal government right back here at home. Wonderful. So if you're interested in clean air and you wanna, you wanna be in those meetings, join the air quality team, we'd love to have you. Thank, thanks, Brandon. Cool. All right, everybody. Well, I uh, really do appreciate the time today. Um, before we close, uh, I, I do want to thank um, Caitlin Blockus with, with Valley Vision, my colleague who did a wonderful uh, bang up job running the back end of, our, of this meeting. Amazing work, Caitlin. <laughs> um, and of course, to the Cleaner Air Partnership's generous contributors and our fantastic lineup of speakers. Thank you all. Um, 
So before, before you hop off, I do, I'm going to post this into the chat. This is our evaluation form that we, that we always do. It's the famous one minute evaluation um, that hopefully won't take you more than that to complete. Really just want to get your read on uh, how we did future topics for luncheons, as well as again, that question about uh, interest in potential in-person meetings. So um, please, please uh, take the poll, take the, the complete the form for you all leave and a recording of this webinar will be available on Valley Vision's YouTube channel in about 72 hours. Um, keep an eye out for an email from me next week. Um, I hope you all enjoy your Friday afternoon and uh, your weekend. Thank you all again for joining us. Oh, it looks like Stacy has her hand raised. Stacy, do you have an announcement? <laughs> Sorry, no, I wanted to go back. I had a quick cap to cap question. Uh, Breathe will be, we'll have at least four representatives there. Um, wanted to know if we have another topic to bring up potentially with air quality, who would I, would that be John that I would talk to about that or, or Brandon, do I go through you there? Uh, you would want to go through the air quality team leads. Uh, Adrian, I think you can help make that connection too, certainly. Uh, we, we are just for folks knowledge, we're, we're limiting papers for the virtual program to two this year for each team. Um, so that is just one caveat to mention, but yeah, absolutely. I think Adrian, you'd probably be the best point person for the team. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, just for everyone's awareness that the air quality team leads for this year are myself, Valley Vision CEO, Evan Schmidt and Placer County Air Pollution Control District CEO, um, Eric White. So those are the three folks. So you can go through any of those. Thanks, Adrian. All right, everybody. Enjoy your weekends. I am going to Yellowstone in a couple hours, so uh, I will talk to you all later, but <laughs> uh, have a wonderful weekend. Bye.